Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman and Reagan Canope. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. Our city was kind of in a transition. I had just gotten off the school board and the city was kind of getting torn in half. Um, I just went and watched and observed, try to be better informed about what was going on because the newspaper was really blowing it up. As the head elected official of the community, I am an advocate for my community, both politically on the state front and the federal front. The lack of trust, especially that you see at the federal level and the state level, carries over into local politics. All right, folks, this week we were very excited to welcome Mayor Dave Drotsman from Hermiston to the podcast. Uh, Mayor Drotsman has been mayor of Hermiston for 10 years, and before that he served on the local school board for eight years. So he's no stranger to holding public office. Uh, Hermiston may not be the city you think it is, as as uh, we talk about in this episode. Actually, it might have been after the episode was over. It is the largest city in eastern Oregon and pretty significantly so. It's larger than Pendleton is now. Um, so he considers himself part of a rural area, as we talk about, but his city is um, relatively large. Uh, and Dave is a, a pretty interesting guy. He's got some thoughts on, we talk a lot about housing and homelessness in this episode. We talk about the urban-rural divide. Um, Dave's involved at the state level, like with the League of Cities and the Oregon um, Mayor's Group. Uh, so he's been part of the formulation of like statewide strategies that the mayors are trying to advance. So I really enjoyed the conversation with him. Um, Reagan, any highlights you want to note for folks or reactions to the episode? Well, I just wanted to note that I have blue light glasses on and we talked to him after the episode and he apparently thinks that that is important to have. So I'm going to wear my blue light glasses a lot more um, because, as you mentioned, he's an eye doctor. So I may have. Did I mention that he's an optometric physician? I may have not, but you'll hear it in the episode. That's his day job. <laughs> Either way. Yeah. Now, you know. Now, you know. Uh, all right. Well, with that, uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. We really appreciate your support and enjoy this week's episode with Mayor Dave Drotsman. Harang Long PC has always recognized that achieving our clients' goals sometimes requires a change in the law. And in other situations, clients need help stopping or changing proposed amendments to the law that put their interests at risk. For decades, we have played a role in shaping Oregon law on many subjects, from narrow regulations to major policy changes implicating billions of dollars. Our lawyers work with clients to draft legislation, prepare legal opinions and testimony to share with legislators, coordinate with professional lobbyists, and work directly with policymakers. To learn more about Harang Long's policy and politics practice, go to harang.com. That's H-A-R-R-A-N-G.com. All right, Mayor Dave Drotsman, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Uh, so we're excited to talk to you. You represent a different perspective than we've heard on the podcast. We've we've heard from some mayors, but we haven't heard from uh, rural mayors. Um, although I don't know, do you consider your uh, do you consider uh, your community rural? It's not a small town. You know, uh, I think you know, legally, kind of like the federal uh, definition, we'd probably be more of a urban setting. But yes, I still consider myself very much rural. rural. So so before we talk about politics, actually, uh, yeah. most mayors in the state of Oregon are not full-time politicians. And uh, you are certainly not. Can you tell us a little bit about your day job? So I'm an optometric physician. I'm a private practitioner uh, in a group practice here in Hermiston, been in Hermiston practicing now. This is my 25th year. So that's here, my day job. Uh, the a, side hustle is my mayor's job. <laughs> so here's a, here's a question weirdly relevant for politics. What is the difference between an optometrist and an optometric physician? Uh, in the state of Oregon? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, a good, yeah, good point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the state of Oregon, uh, we're classified as optometric physician. So I just, I think it, uh, kind of expands upon the definition that typically people think about glasses and contacts. Uh, that's what I uh, optometrists do. Uh, we do so much more than that. We met, we manage uh, medical eye conditions of the eye. Ophthalmology cuts into the eyeball. We don't typically cut into the eyeball, um, but we do a lot of medical management. So I think it 
allows the broader definition of medical eye management into the conversation. There we go. Uh, okay, so now that we've spent uh, 15 seconds on medical issues, we're going to get get into our swing zone, which is politics. Uh, <laughs> so how did you get involved in politics? When did you first run for office? And what drove you to, to initially make that step from the medical world into politics? You know, that's a good question. Um, when I was 14, I grew up in South Dakota. Uh, that's where I was born. Uh, I actually helped out on Tom Daschle's campaign oh, in like no kidding. 1984 or something like that. And so um, I was just door to door knocking, handing out brochures. He won, got invited to a celebratory event. I thought it was all kind of cool and interesting. And then um, so I guess that kind of um, put that that sense in my head that it was important that people um uh, work for their communities to mm -hmm. to make a make a difference and mm -hmm. help support them on a legislative level. So uh, that's probably what the first. My mom was always a big volunteer in her community, and mm -hmm. so I originally started out just as a volunteer in my community, and so I got involved in my community in the Hermston Sports Boosters. I sat on the school board for eight years. Um, this is my tenth year now as mayor. Uh, our city was kind of in a transition. I had just gotten off the school board and uh, the city was kind of uh, getting torn in half, kind of. We had mm -hmm. one of those city council set situations where there's people from the outside throwing a lot of rocks and mm -hmm. saying that they weren't doing enough and maybe the council wasn't being as transparent enough about what they were doing. And so there was some turmoil going on in the community. I started attending city council meetings for a year. Wow. Um, I just went and watched and saw, observed, try to be better informed about what was going on because the newspaper was really blowing it up. We had a an editor at the time that was really taking a personal attention to city politics. And so I decided to go get more informed myself. And uh, after watching for a year, I decided that I would throw my hat in the ring as a city councilor. Um, in that first year, as I'm deciding to run for council, the current mayor actually uh, decided not to run. Hmm. Um, I thought he was a good guy, good civic citizen. I wasn't going to run against him. He had some opposition, um, but he came out and decided not to run. Um, the opposition, um, I decided, was maybe not in the best interest of the community. And so that I just then people were advocating instead of running for council, you should run for mayor. I decided to run for mayor and fortunately uh, good members of my community voted me in. So that was so 10 you, years ago. You got elected mayor before you had served on council. Correct. But you'd yeah. been going to a council council meetings for a year. So it wasn't yeah. a new. A tried new to thing. get informed, you know, tried to understand where the council was at currently so I could be up to speed with what was going on. So, so Reagan, before I hand it over to you, um, Kind of as a level setting question here, uh, how do you describe the job of a mayor? Like if someone says, what do you do? What's your answer? That's funny because I was just in a second grade classroom today reading <laughs> books to kids. <laughs> and so, you know, if you ever try to explain it to a group of, um, you know, seven year olds or eight year olds, uh, you know, it's it's challenging. So my response or my response is always um, as the head elected official of the community. Um, I am an advocate for my community, both uh, politically on the state front and the federal front, uh, meet with dignitaries or other leaders that want to come to our community, um, help in uh, conversations with economic development outreach, as well as um, manage or run council meetings. And so in our community, we have eight counselors and a mayor. I do not vote in my hmm. community unless there's a tie. Mm -hmm. And so um, I run the council meetings and I appoint um, the committees. We have committee structure within our council and I make all the appointments to the committee structures. So there you go, Reagan. Thank you. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting. I was about to say, I was like, you don't vote, but you got eight committee members. You're going to have some ties on your hands, but it sounds like you guys got that figured out. So it's I interesting I to have like five times actually in my tenure. It's, 
Oh, That's really? Kind of interesting. It's, it's pretty rare. There's a lot. I, there's a lot of different governance structures for cities across Oregon, too. It's funny. You don't really find a lot that there, there aren't very many similarities between them. Yeah. Yeah. They're all <laughs> almost all different. Um, so I'd say mayor is in Oregon, a nonpartisan office. We kind of already talked a little bit about that. Um, so you're often dealing with questions that are a lot more about like what's the balance between what the state and the city needs to be doing or your county, right? You're interacting with a lot of other layers of of government. So it's often not super partisan, but does partisan politics ever try to play a role or does it play a role in, in local government? And how do you approach that? So we try to keep everything nonpartisan. I don't personally know the political affiliations of any of my counselors. Hmm. I can probably make some assumptions, but I don't, specifically know um, how they align. Um, it usually stays out of the conversation. Once in a while, uh, we'll get some new counselors potentially that haven't really figured out their role um, in that they represent the whole rather than just a specific segment of their population. Mm -hmm. um, that sometimes is a challenge. Uh, I think most people after a while realize Sometimes they come in with an ax to grind or they have a special purpose or an issue to attend to. Um, but those fade away pretty quickly, I've I've observed. And uh, most people figure out, you know, there's a lot, lot to both sides of this conversation. It's just not all one sided. And so, um, you know, I think most people go in there to try and do good work and they just want to do what's in the best interest of the community as a whole. And eventually, um, those folks that maybe came in as partisan or um, single issue folks uh, eventually come around to a nonpartisan position and doing what's in the best interest of everybody. Along those lines, w w so it's pretty obvious at the state level what the most divisive issues are, what the things that separate people are. The, are there divisive issues at the low? Obviously, before you took over for the council, took over as mayor, it seemed like you were alluding to some divisive issues happening. What are the top the topics or subjects in Hermiston that have divided the community, either historically or in current current day? So, garbage rates. <laughs> <laughs> um, anytime you're talking fees you know, sure. increasing rates, um, you know, one of our responsibilities as constituents of a community is to make sure that we can afford the infrastructure that we have. And so anytime you have a conversation around raising rates, those are always contentious. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people, the lack of trust, especially that you see at the federal level and the state level carries over into local politics yeah. and they come in not trusting us. And so when you unfortunately have to go through a large rate increase, um, they sometimes have trust issues with you. And and um, so that one comes up a lot. Um, one we're dealing right now that comes up about every three or four years is pet issues in your community, something you don't have to deal with on the state level, but, you know, dogs at large, you know, uh, people not oh. taking care of their animals. Um, oh, interesting. Cats. Yeah, you know, just uh, that's what I'll stop you right there. Actually, yeah. there is a surprising number of pet <laughs> issues that come to the legislature. We just passed a bill, a good bill that signified that the state, uh, the official state animal is shelter dogs and cats. Oh, there right. was a bill a few years ago to make a particular breed of dog, the state dog that was extremely controversial. <laughs> and we've taken up multiple bills that deal with if you're allowed to have chickens in your yard. So yes. I will say, I will say you wouldn't normally think a state level issue, but what no, you know, people try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, so I think, it, you know, most of the time um, people are only getting part of the story. And so when you allow them to come in and participate in the public process, get more informed, sometimes they just need to vent. They mm -hmm. just, you know, they're angry and they're upset and they just want to allow they want to be heard. And so I'm pretty good about allowing public participation, allowing people to, you know, voice their opinion and not get contentious or confrontational about it. Um, that's never any good. And so we always kind of redirect those individuals. Um, thank you for your participation. You know, can I have the city manager uh, follow up with you and 
most of the time we can manage that through education processes. So not a lot of hugely contentious issues going on right now. So um, by timeline here, you you said eight years on the school board. So what was your first year on school board? Like 2005-ish? Three-ish. Okay, 2000. Like 2011. Yeah. Okay. And then mayor is like 2013? 2013, yeah. Okay, so during your time in public office, yeah. there have been, in my opinion, like pretty dramatic changes in the political culture of this country. So when you start, it's like the George W. Bush uh, era. Um, like I think like polarization is maybe starting to heat up a little bit, but then it really crescendos in 2010. Um, Tea Party movement nationally. People are showing up to all the town halls and protesting. And then, of course, in, in 2016, with the presidential election and the election of Donald Trump, probably our greatest polarization, at least in my yeah. lifetime. And, you know, I, I on a school board, so I saw versions of that showing up in, in my suburban community. I'm kind of curious during your time in both of these public offices, how has the has the political culture of Hermiston shifted or has, has like divisiveness shown up? Um, from like anger in constituents or or in other ways, I'm kind of curious what you've observed as in, any shifts over your your time holding these local roles. I think any of the um, kind of national headlines that have hit major metropolitan areas have hit us to a certain degree, just on a smaller level. Mm -hmm. So even when the BLM movement was going a couple um, years back, we had some protests here locally as well. Um, nothing as contentious as what went on in downtown Portland. We didn't have, you know, broken windows and spray paint and Antifa and all that sort of stuff. But we had marches and and most they were all civil um, and there was multiples of them. Um, so any of those sort of nationalized issues, I think, do play a little part here locally, uh, even with the Roe versus Wade issue decision um, played some small. Um, there was some. I don't want to say um, out, you know, there were some people that were protesting or, you know, small groups that were out. Um, and so those those sort of issues we see, um, I, I'm not sure that it's ne necessarily new, frankly. Um, hmm. I think what has happened is media has multiplied that and our hmm. access to media and social media particularly, I think, has been extremely harmful. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think as you're hearing more and more about, you know, Twitter and Facebook and how they are selecting conversations to individuals, I think that's really been harmful to the conversation because you're not getting a broad spectrum of input from different parties or positions. You're just hearing one echo chamber of people talking all the time. And so I think that is, you know, added fuel to the fire. And that's kind of uh, accelerated the uh, separation. Mm -hmm. That's my personal. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate that because I think um, we, you know, that Ben, I would say, uh, I don't know if you've noticed this, but that seems to be a theme that we're hearing from a lot of elected officials who've seen this transition is they, you know, whether, whether we can prove it or not, they, there's a lot of belief that social media has been the thing that has kind of made this thing worse. And I think, it's it's bad on a couple levels the main one being that you, the self-selecting like you said you're getting more reinforcement of your beliefs instead of things that challenge your beliefs and exactly. you don't always change your mind based on information that challenges your beliefs maybe you even don't very often but if you're never being challenged it's really hard to build a good and informed belief system i think that's take right. into account those things I think most people lie, 80% of people lie somewhere in the middle. And they like to hear the pros and cons of a decision that's being made. But when you're always hearing just one side of an issue, then it's really hard to create that chasm between the two parties. And so that's just kind of my observation, as well as, you know, the um, television personalities have really Probably. gotten partisan. And so... You know, you used to have, I remember Tom Brokaw, you know, this guy's the guy, I, my dad actually went to high school with this guy. And I used to look to him for, you know, unbiased, nonpartisan research and information. And, you know, 
60 minutes and some of the TV show broadcasts you used to watch just for um, Dan Rather, you know, used to mm-hmm. look for nonpartisan information. Today, it's all partisan. Mm-hmm. And so, there's, you know, where does a person go today to find nonpartisan information um, that that isn't feeding into our separation, unfortunately? Do you think is that sorry, Reagan? Um is there, there's a couple of things happening at the same time that I think are probably related, but I'm wondering what you think about this. So on one hand, you've got this increased polarization, you've got a media echo chamber, people self-selecting the type of news that reinforces their beliefs. I think you could put misinformation in that mm-hmm. mix too, of like just a, a toxic information ecosystem that contributes to polarization. Um, and maybe part of that dynamic influences this other thing, which is trust in government is at a nearly all time low. Like people just assume that the government is doing bad things, um, that the people who hold seats in of power are uh, corrupt or um, uh, or have bad intentions, um, et cetera. Do you have a thesis on why that might be? And even at the local level, like you alluded to, like it seems, it seems to me people trust even local politicians less than they did before. Uh, although I would, I'm almost certain like you would probably have a higher trust in your community than maybe your legislators would, and they would have a much higher trust than probably members of Congress would. Like, I think it probably goes up from there. That's just a theory. I don't know if that's right or not. Yeah. Um, but I'm, do you have any thoughts on, on what has been driving that dynamic of decreased trust in government? I think past leaders have unfortunately led that pathway. You know, I think if a politician does what's in the best interest of their community and they don't do it for personal reasons and they do the the job that the majority of people want them to do and they're Mm -hmm. transparent about it and they're not misappropriating funds or creating special projects, um, you know, we one of the things that I really worked on when I tried to come in, when I came into city council was trying to be as transparent as possible. Let's put everything out there, give the community all the access they need in order to make informed decisions, whether it's financial, our budget is online. We do financial reports. We report on, on a regular meeting. Um, We do all of our meetings online. Now you can participate online. Uh, All of our information is readily accessible uh, to the community. And so just trying to also engage the community in the conversation, look for public input, I think is important. If you don't ask the people, they often uh, assume that, you know, you're, you're doing it for your own personal reasons. But if you put um, groups together to have a conversation, um, then I think it's it's a healthier environment and mm-hmm. they have a lot more trust. Right now we have, I personally feel, <laughs> we haven't pulled this, but I personally feel like we got a lot of trust in in city government in Hermiston right now, so. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I want to pivot over to uh, housing and homelessness, particularly from your, you know, more rural perspective. I think a lot of the discussion at the legislature is, is good, um, and, and at the state level, particularly on housing, and even at local levels in big cities, it's all really good. But I think even maybe even suburban Republicans don't quite understand Um, rural housing issues and rural homelessness issues and how they might be the same and how they might be different from the state level. So if you um, have some, some background or experience with how that has uh, happened in Hermiston or what you guys are dealing with in Hermiston, I think that would be uh, pretty interesting to our listeners. So um, I don't know if you guys are aware of this. I sit on the league of Oregon cities uh, board of directors. I'm their current uh, vice president. Mm -hmm. Uh, I served three years prior to that. I served last year as the treasurer and then three years prior to that. Um, I am currently on the OMA mayor's task force that came out with the housing and homelessness recommendation. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I've been engaged with that process over the last year. So in, in Hermiston specifically, uh, one of the things that we recognized, well, shortly after the 2008 housing bubble crisis um, that we weren't able to produce enough housing. We're a pretty rapidly growing community. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but we are also the largest community in Eastern Oregon by a significant margin, by 20% now. It used to be Pendleton, mm-hmm. now it's us. Um, and we oh, that I didn't know. know. I just, I, I kept assuming Pendleton was the biggest city in Eastern Oregon. Yeah, no, we are the largest and, and we have been for about five years, maybe six years. Wow. Um, and so we're growing somewhere around one and a half to 2% a year. 
Um, and so one of the, the reasons for that is we have economic opportunities here, which we've been working on. I think economic development helps to drive the workforce. It's always got to be forefront of the decisions that you're making for your community. If you can't, don't have jobs and people aren't going to come here. We have plenty of jobs. So if there are West Siders looking for jobs in a more affordable <laughs> place to live, Hermiston <laughs> is it. Um, and then we also had a conversation in our community with our home builders. We sat down with them. We sat down with the industry and said, what is the barriers to you guys um, building more houses here? It's happening across the river in Tri-Cities. Tri-Cities, you know, a population of, I don't know, 300,000 people right now. It's huge. And um, they're building like crazy over there. We're just 30 minutes away. How come you can't build here? And so we went through conversations with contractors to try and figure out what the barriers and hurdles were. And so we went through some land use decisions and changes mm. through our planning department. And that came in front of the council that allowed some more flexibility in our building. Um, that made a huge difference. Um, so housing right now, we built 210 houses last year, which is pretty huge on a proportion. If every city in the state were able to do that, we'd meet Governor Kotex 36,000 houses. Goal. No kidding. Um, on a per capita basis. Yeah, we're doing we're doing pretty well here, uh, but we still need more. And affordability is the biggest issue. You know, getting into houses, the, we've also seen the cost cost of housing go up significantly in our community. So affordable housing, more of that workforce housing, um, apartments. We need a lot more apartment buildings and, you know, the the people just entering the workforce and how do they get into, um, you know, housing, those sort of areas. In regards to homelessness, uh, we have seen a uptick in homelessness in our community recently. Um, we were one of the eight pilot projects that was approved in the legislature last year. And so we are working as a, a four, four community, um, Umatilla, Hermiston, Stanfield, and Echo, as well as the county are partnering on a project called the PATH Project. And so we're working to build more homelessness housing. So um, both homeless housing, but also transition housing. And so that's a process through the pilot program. We also have implemented uh, like a navigation organization that's going to help us through that process that will help to facilitate, you know, behavioral health concerns and issues, drug and alcohol addiction, employment. Um, and so Stepping Stones Alliance is who we've partnered with to help us um, work through the challenges that our homeless population has. But, you know, it's, it's resource contingent and a lot of it's eaten up you know, general fund dollars right now that could be going to public safety and parks and and uh, libraries. And so uh, we need a partner strategically at the state level that can help us with that. And so as part of the OMA task force, we proposed, you know, $50 per capita going to all the communities across the state because cities like mine wouldn't get a larger share, but we'd get enough of a share that we could help facilitate more housing at, a, at an affordable le level by offsetting SDCs potentially or using them in our houseless, um, in our uh, path project to help with our homelessness challenges. So we, we've we've talked about this before on this podcast, but for newer listeners, can you explain yeah. systems development charges and why they're an important part of this equation? So yeah, so um, when a new house gets built, they have to have um, plumbing to that building, uh, water plumbing, sewer plumbing, streets, and that all costs money. And so that's on the um, owner of the business or the resident to uh, install those. Um, so they have to pay for those as part of their hookup to the the city's facilities. So the SD, so you often, and correct me if I'm wrong here or at any context, like oftentimes in conversations about, you know, incentivizing more housing or building more affordable housing you'll hear people talk about well we need to waive at sdcs like they're they're the difference between profitability and not um the challenge is if you get rid of the sdcs to your point you're not you don't you're not actually collecting money to build the infrastructure that goes right. to the house right. um so the, the, those things are not negotiable they have to get paid for but what is negotiable is like who pays for them and when you pay for them can be negotiable. Um, but like waiving SDCs is, um, is a tactic that some like Tiger, when we had Jason Snyder on the podcast, he talked about um, different strategies that they've, they've employed. Um, so how, yeah. How, how have you navigated that in Hermiston? 
Yeah, unfortunately, the conversation at the state right now seems to be like cities are the barriers to housing. And um, we're trying to do everything we can to put infrastructure in place and make it affordable, changing zoning codes. Um, you know, Hermiston's had a lot of uh, fortuitous opportunities to help us with, um, you know, our housing infrastructure. And that's helped bring down the cost of building out developments. Um, but yeah, somebody's got to pay those fees. And so if it's not the actual homeowner or the business that are paying for the SDCs, it's going to come out of the general fund or out of our water budget. And then the rest of the community pays. And how is that fair to the rest of the community? Because we're, we're going to pass those fees along to the consumer because they're paid out of the water or wastewater or streets department. But it it's not going to allow us to stretch those dollars any farther. And so we won't be able to build as much either if we don't have the funds coming in to backfill the cost to build out the new one. What did you mean by... Um... The conversation at the state seems like people are framing cities as the the problem or the obstacle to building more housing. What's your perception? So I'm seeing um, legislation and and testimony at the and even you know Governor Kotex recently spoke about housing and we need to have cities more accountable to housing and um, reducing the barriers and you know a lot of the land use issues that are put in place were put in by the legislature. We don't have any control of that. And whether those get appealed to Luba, we don't have any control of that. There's processes that have to allow people to participate in the conversation. Their neighbors get to say whether or not they want new development, you know, and then those issues could be appealed. And those aren't our issues. Those are mandated by the state. And so um, we're working through the processes. But a lot of times it's like the finger pointing is the city is the problem and the holdup and, the, and creating the barriers. And it's it, I want to argue that that it's not us. We're trying to build houses as fast as possible, and we're not putting up um, unnecessary fees, at, at least in the city of Hermiston. I could speak for Hermiston specifically. We mm -hmm. aren't creating unnecessary fees. We're just looking to recoup the cost of the infrastructure um, that was paid to get them hooked up. So I actually am really interested. I've been, I've been trying to learn more about uh, land use planning, because land use planning is at the very center of the conversation about housing, but it's also at the very center of the conversation about semiconductors, right. which are both like dominant issues in this state right now. Um, and I think like for someone from my political persuasion, like land use planning is something that Oregon should be really proud of and has helped keep this state uh, beautiful and iconic and special in a way that a lot of other states, because they did not have the foresight that Oregon had, um, didn't make those decisions. And so their states look a lot different than ours. Um, but there's an argument on the other side that says the pressure that has been built up by that constrained growth um, is now part of the reason Reagan makes this argument to me. That's part of the reason why um, housing is not affordable. We don't have enough places to, you know, and why we're not competitive on economic development. I'm kind of curious where you fall on that question or or what 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 uh pieces from each perspective um because at the local level in Oregon system like you're responsible for executing <laughs> implementing right. land use policy so I'm I'm curious what your perspective from the mayor's seat is Well I believe local control is best and I like the decision making ability left up to the communities allowing them the flexibility to design how their communities should grow out you know, a couple of years ago, we had some mandates come down from the legislature that said, essentially, residential, single family home residential is no longer existent. You can build whatever you want on that residential lot, triplex, a duplex, a quadplex, cottage cluster, whatever, no longer single family zoning exists. A lot of us were frustrated with that. Why, um, why, why were you frustrated with that? Well, because a lot I of think, people, it, if the, the argument for that is like, we're in a housing crisis. There's not enough units. Let's stop with the nimbyism. Let's allow people. That's what the argument the other side would make. So yep, what's your well, perspective? Yeah. Um, in communities like mine, there's available land to build on. And so there are zoned properties that you could go build a duplex or a triplex mm. or a quadplex. So, I mean, it's water under the bridge. We're moving forward now and, and we're adjusting to it. The challenge is the current infrastructure was built out for single family residential zoning, right? So there's not enough parking. The piping for water and sewer weren't big enough. Mm -hmm. um, and so the infrastructure isn't there to support them as well. And so now we're having to go back and how do we tear up infrastructure? Or how do we pay for the infrastructure, build out the infrastructure to support those developments too? So again, I think, I think it should be left up to the community. 
as far as your urban growth boundary concerns, and uh, I believe, you know, ag, super important. Forest, yeah. super important. You know, we've got a beautiful state. We should work to, you know, keep it that way. And our agricultural um, zones are super important to the, the future success of our state as well. And so respectful of those, I think, you know, it's been in place since, was it Tom McCall? Mm -hmm. um, that uh, put them in place during his governorship, that uh, we have land use rules for a reason. There are some communities that are really tight right now. They're up against the urban growth boundary, and I understand the concerns to try and expand those. I think it should be allowed on a per um, city basis. Yeah. I think there should be some flexibility in that, uh, as long as it doesn't get into urban or into urban sprawl in ag and um, forest, you know, our, our beautiful spaces that we want to continue to appreciate. Mm -hmm. Reagan. So our last question um, before we wrap up is focus on uh, one of our other favorite uh, hot topics here. We're just hitting you with all of our hot topics, <laughs> uh, which is urban rural divide. And I think you've alluded to this in some different circumstances where you've said things have come down from the state it's possible that a lot of people that represent uh, communities in the legislature come from bigger cities sometimes, you know, maybe a city in Multnomah County, we might, we won't mention city in Lane County, we won't mention. Right. And so they don't always. Gresham have, and Springfield. Um, that, those are definitely <laughs> the cities I was talking about. Yep. And huge. <laughs> um, and so you don't always get the, maybe the final solution isn't always one that includes everything that the rural communities have asked for, right? And so the, you know, the urban rural um, divide, I think is really what I'm asking about, right? And how do you see the urban rural divide and how do you see steps forward or, or things that you have done or, or people could do, um, not just you, of course, um, to solve the urban rural divide or at least make it better? Great question. Um, I think it's real. I think there is an urban rural divide. Um, I think I think most people realize that rural parts of our state need support. At least they verbalize that. But the unfortunate part is I don't see a lot of action towards that. I think we're often left out or last in the conversation when it comes to making the decisions. And often we're outvoted. Uh, and so it does seem a lot of times like we don't matter. And that's frustrating coming from a rural community, whether you're on the coast, you're in Eastern Oregon, Southern Oregon. Um, it's very frustrating. It does seem like all the decisions that are coming down come from Portland Metro I-5 corridor, you know, from mm -hmm. Portland to Eugene. And so uh, I think there are good people trying to do good work for the state. Um, but I think, we need to have um, more conversation across the aisle and inclusion. We talk about inclusion all the time. I think rural needs to be a part of that inclusion conversation as we often get left out in the decision-making ability. Um, we are different. We're different from the metro areas and we like it that way. We choose to live here. We have really intelligent people that live out here as well but we chose to live here. It's not because we can't live in Portland or we can't live in Eugene. It's because we choose to live here. Um, but sometimes we get punished because of that, because the population voting matrix doesn't work out. And so um, I think if we're going to bridge that urban rural divide, some of our larger metropolitan representatives need to make sure that they're cognizant that we matter and they need to demonstrate that with action, not just with words. Um, interrogating this question just a little bit before we wrap, um, yeah. is, this, is this about outcomes or process? And what I mean by that is, you know, there there is a way to have voices included in the process, to have an open and transparent and inclusive process um, and still not get the outcomes that you want. Yeah. Um, and then there's the question of like, well, and maybe that would in and of itself be frustrating. Well, we keep having our voices at the table, but we don't have as many votes as the people who live in the bigger cities. So we end up losing. Is it is it one of one or, or both of, of those the process or outcomes? 
You know, I, I think I think you're accurate on both. Outcomes is, I think, more important. Um, I'll tell you a little story. I got a little brother. Okay. I used to play basketball with him all the time. Always used to beat him every single time. Guess what? Eventually, he didn't want to play basketball with me anymore. Sometimes you got to let the little guy win. And right now, it does seem like we're not allowing the little guy to participate in the conversation. And that's the frustrating part because eventually the little guy is just going to take the basketball and go home and doesn't want to participate. And that's not good for the state. And that's not good for the conversation of the future of the state. So I guess uh, we'll, to wrap this topic in, in the podcast, uh, for for leaders at the state level, whether they be in, in the executive branch or the legislative branch, what would your advice be to folks who are sort of decision makers to try to what are some practical things people could do to begin to to make and make headway on this challenge? Try and seek out bipartisan conversation. Try and include rural communities in the conversation. Um, allow them to be heard, not just to sit at the table, but actually have value in the conversation. Um, I think there's room for for growth in that conversation so that we come out with a better uh, process. One of the things that's beautiful about local city government, because it's nonpartisan, we're always doing what's in the best interest of the majority of folks. That 80% of people that lie in the middle, that's the best outcome that we're going to reach to. Whether you're right or left, that's where we, I think we all want to get to. And we can't have that if the conversation is all one-sided. Well, Mayor Drotsman, thank you so much for making time to come on the podcast. If folks want to get in contact with you or learn more about what's going on in Hermiston, where would you direct them? Um, I am on Twitter at Mayor Drotz, D-R-O-T-Z. Um, I am also available through the, the city's website, Hermiston, hermiston.gov, something, hermiston.or.gov. We'll, we'll link to it so people can get okay. to it in the description. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on, David. We really appreciate it. Thank you for the invite. Good talking with you.